Pixel Therapy is a member of the But Why Though Podcast Network. Go to butwhythopodcast.com for an inclusive geek community offering pop culture news, reviews, and podcasts. Sometimes in the game, like, you just gotta leave. You just gotta leave where you are, because I'm like, I'm not ready to beat this Lionel right now. Like, I do not have the tools. I do not have the stamina. I can't do this. And sometimes I feel the same way about, like, a work problem or a poetry issue I'm having. Welcome to Pixel Therapy, the video game podcast where we look at the games we play through the lens of the player, where what you play is just as important as how you play it, and where emotional intelligence is a critical stat. Every other week, we bring on a guest who may or may not consider themselves a gamer to discuss the games that have made them and changed them and all the feelings they have about our favorite pastime. I'm your co-host, Jamie, pronouns she, her. And I am your co-host, Spencer, pronouns they, them. And this is Pixel Therapy. Uh, buckle in, folks. We've got your new and noteworthies Choo-choo. for you. <laughs> Here comes the new and noteworthies train. <laughs> Our April Patreon bonus episode is up right now. So if you go on over to patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod, you can catch that there. This month, Spencer and I put together our short list of game recommendations for new gamers. Uh, we try to introduce a variety of genres to folks who may be new to gaming. So if that's of interest to you, you can go get that Patreon bonus episode plus every other bonus episode we've done so far by visiting patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod and subscribing for just $2 a month. If you're a fan of what we do on Pixel Therapy, which I assume you are if you are listening to this right now, <laughs> uh, it's a great way to support the show. Hi, haters. <laughs> that's Just not, kidding. That's not in the cards for you. Uh, I mean, you know what? Hate listen to Pixel Therapy Pod. I don't care. You can, you can hate listen to it. That's okay. Uh, you know, get that download. We understand. <laughs> <laughs> if it's, uh, but, uh, you know, if a Patreon subscription is not in the cards for you, that's okay. We still love and appreciate you. Mm-hmm. And you'll keep getting your biweekly dose of pixel therapy for free wherever podcasts are available to you. Uh, but speaking of ways to support us, we've been saying it for a minute, uh, but it's finally happened. <gasps> we've got a new podcast review over on Apple Podcasts. Uh, user Ristel, R H I S T E L gave us a lovely five-star review. They wrote, fantastic podcasts. I am so happy I found this podcast. That's us. That's this podcast. Oh my God. I We're like this, this podcast. <laughs> We're this podcast. I like this pod because it tackles issues not talked about in other pods, such as race and gender. It's nice to hear two wonderful hosts. That's you and me, Spencer. <gasps> oh my God. Discuss these issues in the context of gaming. Okay, you know, this is a real podcast listener because they use the word pod and that's like what cool podcast listeners do so like yeah that's true i wow i'm honored thank you (laughs) yes thank you so much for your kind words uh we really do appreciate these reviews uh and not just for our ego's sake uh but they're just a really important metric in measuring the overall success of a podcast uh you know when we're talking to other podcasters and (laughs) and i don't know the podcast community in the podcast community and the whole you know the podcast universe that exists uh out there uh, so if you're inclined to head over to Apple Podcasts or, uh, as we mentioned on the last episode, Podchaser, uh, who are still doing their review for Good Campaign for the month of April, where every review left on their site earns a 25 cent donation towards Meals on Wheels, America's Go Further program. Uh, you can rate us. You can review us. It'll help us. It'll help Meals on Wheels. And uh, maybe maybe you'll even get your review read on the podcast. So just helping everybody. Wow. Yeah. You're just a great person. Thank yeah. you. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Uh, Spencer, I think you've got something fun for us this week. You're absolutely right, Jamie. We have something very fun from our friends at TomTalk. That's T-O-M-T-O-C. TomTalk is a tech-savvy, design-driven brand making simply the sleekest bags and cases for all you aesthetic gamers out there, um, of which I know there are many. Um, They are iMore Choice Award winners, as well as the New York Times Wirecutter pick um, for Nintendo Switch cases. Um, They sent us a few of these of their cases. So TomTalk is, they make like... Uh, surprisingly affordable and like really well made um, cases for like iPads, like Mac products if you have them, but specifically um, Nintendo Switch and then the Nintendo Switch Lite. Um, they sent us a few to try out, and I have to say I've been using them pretty much weekly. As um, as some of you know, I've been <laughs> um, playing Stardew Valley, and at the same time in real life, my partner and I have um, purchased a home in a in a 
very small little town that is very started Valley esque. And so I've been bringing my <laughs> switch back and forth as we're still kind of living in the apartment. Um, and I've been using the cases that Tom Talk set, and they are awesome, like um, really cute. Um, really modern. Um, I was actually supposed to send one to Jamie because they sent me two, <laughs> one for each of us, which was very kind of them. And I, I didn't do that. I'm, they're that good. They, they make you betray your friendships. Um, so anyway, long story short, Tom Talk gave us a promo code to share with all of you. The promo code is Pixel Therapy, and you can use it to get 20% off of Tom Talk's protective case for the Nintendo Switch Lite. It's a super cute silicone case with, um, in like four or five different colors. Um, they gave us an affiliate link, so you need to go to this link. It's amzn.to slash 31milnj. I know it's impossible to remember, so I... <laughs> No, I got it. I think I got it. <laughs> I put, Basically, I, you just say the entire alphabet and throw a couple numbers in. Yeah, and you got it. But anyway, I know that's impossible to remember, so I put the link in our bios on both Instagram and Twitter, at Pixel Therapy Pod. Um, you can check out those accounts and hit that link. Use code Pixel Therapy and get 20% off um, super cute products from TomTalk. The code is good until May 4th. Um, so thanks again to TomTalk, and um, yeah, check out their stuff. Yeah, check them out. I mean, they look cute. I've seen the pictures. <laughs> Someday she hopes to be an owner of a Tom Talk case herself. Someday I'll get my hands on one of those babies. Uh, <laughs> all right, folks, it's time to get cozy. Pull up that armchair and feel free to lie down on your couch because we're going to talk about our feelings. Spencer, what, what do you got for us today? What's going on in your world? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's been, I feel like everyone I talk to has been really overwhelmed and busy lately and mm. I and I count myself alongside um so I I've been playing a little games here and there like I've I've been dipping my feet back into Stardew Valley because it's very much a comfort game for me. Um, and as you know, we are members of the But Why Though podcast network. Um, sure. And But Why Though is a website that has all sorts of gaming and pop culture reviews and news. So I've been reviewing games um, for them, which has been really rewarding and really fun. Um, shout out to uh, Matt and Kate and everyone at But Why Though for like woo, woo, woo. letting me do that. It's like been super cool. But a game that I had the opportunity to review lately was one that I would love to talk about with y'all. Um, it was actually, it's this, this game is called The Longing um, and it was dropped during uh, Nintendo's uh, Indie World Showcase. Uh, I think it was April 14th. So it just came out a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's from a German developer, Studio Seufs. And forgive me if I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, German friends. But super cool indie studio and the longing is really unique because it it may just be the longest game uh ever <laughs> created it is 9600 hours long and that's 9600 real time hours and 400 days um and essentially it's a story that's rooted in, in German folklore, um, but you are playing as the shade. Um, and the shade is like a tiny little soot like creature, kind of like reminiscent of the, like the little Miyazaki soot sprites that float around with those big, cute, adorable eyes. Um, so you're a little shade who is the last servant of uh, the king of this massive labyrinthine underground labyrinthine i don't know how to pronounce things i just i just read them it's like a labyrinth <laughs> <laughs> um i knew what you meant thank you um uh this big massive underground kingdom and the kingdom is empty there's there's no one else there and with the game when the game opens the king just simply commands you to um let him sleep and watch over his <laughs> kingdom and then awaken him in 400 days. At oh, which my God. Point King is living the dream. Yeah, <laughs> for real. <laughs> my I wish God. I, can I just fast forward? Could you just please take care of all my shit and I'm going to sleep for a year and a half. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, bye. Yes. Um, but he says when he wakes up, he's going to bring about the end of all pain and oh. longing. Oh, oh. That sounds good, right? <laughs> yeah. Is that what would happen if we took a 400-day nap? All right. So let's look into it. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, there's a lot of superhero origin stories, but this mm. is, this one seems unique. Right, because all you have to do is sleep. I mean, shit. If it were that easy. <laughs> we could all be superheroes. Damn. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting premise. So essentially, it's kind of like a cross between Animal Crossing... And like a Tamagotchi, like essentially you are now responsible for the well-being of this little soot creature. Um, 
and you could, I mean, you could get up and turn off the game and leave and just come back in 400 days because the, the clock keeps counting down um, no matter if you're playing or not. Um, essentially, so once the king gives you that order, there's a countdown that starts at the top of the screen that follows you constantly throughout the game. Um, and it just continuously marches down those those seconds and minutes and hours and days. Um, and so you can spend your time, um, you're, you're your little uh, shade has a house that you can fill with furniture. Um, you can walk around exploring the caves. One rule the king gave you is that you are not allowed to leave the caves. Very, uh, very Hades esque. Mm, mm. um, but that being said, it looks as though there is a way. If you kept going, um, you might find your way out. So, what mm. happens if you betray the king? Who knows? There are multiple endings to the game. Hmm. Um, oh my God! So you have to play it multiple times. <laughs> Yeah. This is uh, a forever I game. Never play yeah. another game this again. Is the, this is the last game you'll ever play. It's a bargain <laughs> at fourteen ninety nine. <laughs> oh my god. Um I think it, it it's just it's different from any game I've ever played. Um oh yeah. and, and one thing I want to mention is the art style and those kind of vibes. Um it has this really cool sort of dungeon synth soundtrack um that very subtly shifts and uh grows and changes as you explore the caves and it's just Hmm. it's very immersive it's great with headphones um and the art style is very reminiscent of uh, it's all hand-drawn um and it's kind of like edward gory meets uh fantastic planet film from the 70s if folks aren't familiar definitely look it up um but it's kind of very surreal um muted colors uh like thin lines and, and and detailed intricate uh like line work, very evocative and uh, very bleak, but also kind of homey. And um, it's it's just very, very interesting. It's very much a game that you, I, w- I would encourage you to approach as you'd approach art uh, for the kind mm-hmm. of experiential nature of it. I wouldn't try to approach it as like, you know what I feel like doing? Having fun and just, <laughs> just uh, mindlessly doing something um because most of the game is spent walking Mm -hmm. um there's no fast travel um as the shade you walk at a excruciatingly slow pace for anyone who's used to just kind of i don't know being able to use items or potions or things to speed up and Mm -hmm. like there's none of that um and so a lot of times you're just walking down these endless corridors and I find that it's kind of almost meditative, like without any stimuli. I mean, not that there's no stimuli, but my brain wanders. Mm. And I think I sometimes approach games to escape them. So one that kind of forces me to be alone with my thoughts and to embrace that um, Mm -hmm. was was just really fascinating. Um, And I think the game is aware of that. And it's, it's just, it's really cool. I definitely encourage folks to check out The Longing. Do you, I don't know. I don't know if I, I saw the trailer for this mm-hmm. one at the Indie World Showcase. And I, d- I like agree that it, the look of it, the whole like idea behind it sounds really interesting. Like, but I just don't like, I don't know. I mean, I hear you saying like, yeah, no, it's not fun. It's definitely an experience. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to actually like pick this game up and check it out. Like, I love that it exists and I love like, I very inter- I was very interested yeah. to like read what you had to say about it and like hear what you had to say about it. But I don't know. Do you think you would have? I don't know. Do you think you would have played this otherwise? Do you see yourself sticking with it and continuing to check in on the shade like long term? Great question, Jamie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe I should revise my recommend. I recommend folks check it out if you are looking to be challenged yeah. by a game. Um, if you're looking to sort of push your expectations of what a game can or should be. Um, and if you are just want to invest in creative experimental game development, mm-hmm. yeah, um, then those are great reasons to buy the longing. Um, and I, yeah, I I think that what I want to do is periodically check in mm-hmm. on the shade. Like I like the idea of you know popping in, doing a little exploration. Let me seeing if I can find some items for my cave and then popping out again. But it's not a game that I feel like I'm going to be playing linearly and every day um, living in it because really it becomes like a lifestyle because it truly is passing by in real time. So, um, you know, I think 
I am someone who sh- struggles to meditate. Like I, I get really impatient. I, I'll try to listen to the audio, the guided meditations, and I, I just get frustrated or distracted or too aware of my body and uh, like intrusive thoughts come in. So I kind of, what I've noticed is that when I'm playing it, because there's that visual stimuli and the music and like I'm, I'm inhabiting this world. So that's kind of occupying my brain enough that I can sort of let the thoughts, like when you're, when you're meditating and you're supposed to just kind of let the thoughts pass through you like water and not try to hold on or focus too much on anyone and, and just experience whatever comes up. Um, I find that it allows me to do that, which I found pretty interesting. So like, I think using it as a tool could be really beneficial if I need to just sort of get out of my, or just give myself the space to um, clear my head or yeah, like get back in touch with myself. Giving yourself something. Uh, uh, I find like I can't maybe concentrate better when I've got like something tactile going on too. So it's almost yeah. like, it's giving you something to like occupy one side of your brain while letting the other side roam freely. Cause it's not yeah. presenting you with like a narrative or anything to really hone your attention on. But th- then there's also stuff in the game. Like I, I think I don't remember if you were telling me this or if I read this, but you can like read books within the game. Yes. Yeah, so you can find, they uh, populated the game with like hundreds of titles from the Gutenberg project, uh, which is a uh, archive of, uh, free ebooks. So there are classics, literature classics um, that you can, there's a secret library that you can find in the game, but there's also like you can just find books on um, different places and then they'll be added to your library in your little home. Um, so you can, yeah, you can just spend time looking for books and reading them in the game. That's one way you can pass the time. Um, you can also draw, um, like you, like you can find, um, pieces of chalk or minerals and um, just sit there and and watch as the shade will draw a picture but it will take a long like it'll take almost it's a little bit sped up from a real artist but it, it really is forcing you to be in the present and mm-hmm. like you're interacting with these items as if they're real life items which is really fascinating yeah well, and I'm just kind of having this like thought now too of like the way the shade is is trapped in this isolation for these 400 odd days and like isn't supposed to go out to the world and like how reminiscent of that is to like what we've been living through in quarantine yeah and like you're he's kind of being forced to or like they i guess it's not a gendered right the shade isn't yeah the shade is a non a non-binary icon (laughs) yes thank you um the way that yeah, you're just like forced to sit with the isolation, yeah. the fact that time is passing and yeah. The shades like kind of like finding little things to do, you're finding little things to do with them, but it's right, it's like the there's like these bright spots breaking up the monotony, but it like it forces you to sit with your loneliness. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. I think too, the the longer that you sort of sit with it, um, like as you're walking, the shade will start talking to themselves. Oh. Or, um, you know, there's also this this sort of item you can collect uh, that's intangible, but essentially, um, like if your shade approaches an obstacle that he can't climb up, or um, he spends 10 minutes walking down a corridor that just ends in a dead end, which is a thing that happens and you have to spend 10 more minutes walking back. (laughs) Um, (laughs) They'll collect disappointments. So it will say like, I've collected one disappointment. Oh my God. So when you go back home, you can see not just your items, but how many disappointments you've, you've stocked up. Um, (laughs) This game might be too real for me. Actually, (laughs) the more I hear you talk about, I'm just like, this might not be giving me the like (laughs) escapism that I've been finding with video games this past year to like, to transport myself to somewhere else that isn't the isolated uh, reality that we're living in. Um, This might be like too focused on, I could see like when we're not in quarantine anymore, like maybe a few years from now when that feels like, like I could see this being an interesting way to like go back to that. But I just, I don't know that I would have the wherewithal to play it now. Right. It's like rather than transporting you out of isolation, it's sort of creating a space that teaches you to find the humor in it. Mm. 
and like the shade is has this sort of cautious optimism Mm -hmm. like they know that they're alone and they know that it's it's a long long time until things are going to change and they kind of manage to find this sort of wry humor in that um with themselves and i don't know I, i really feel like this game is doing just that sort of um sort of approaching coping with this sort of isolation from a perspective of of really leaning into it. <laughs> mm. Wow. What a that sounds like it sounds like such a cool it sounds so cool conceptually and even in execution. Yeah. But a maybe a challenging game to experience. Yeah, it it's a it's a hard one to sort of play like you would play any other game. Mhm. Mhm. Unique, very unique. Yeah. Um Oh my gosh! I had I had a whole list of like indie games that I wanted to spotlight, but I took I took so much time talking about the longing. <laughs> um, there's it's felt like there's been an overwhelming amount of really cool indie titles that have been announced or um, you know sort of just being elevated into more of a, the mainstream like gaming sphere, which I'm, I'm, I'm I love seeing that from like with Xbox's Game Pass and um, with Nintendo adding more and more indie mm-hmm. titles to their store. Um, it's like a just, year of the indie right now. Yeah. Like I, I do feel like we have this, um, and, and, and the big AAA releases are kind of starting to pick up. There isn't a lot that's like definitively coming out, uh, right now that like I am personally super excited for, like what we've got, like resident evil coming up, which I'll watch people play, but I'm not going to play myself. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. We just, and I think part of this is due to COVID, but there seems to be a bit of a lull it's probably mm-hmm. partially due to COVID and partially due to the new consoles, but there's a little bit of a lull right now in like the big AAA game releases, um, which I don't mind at all. It certainly gives more time to catch up on backlog, but but like because mm-hmm. of that lull, I, I do feel like all of these indie devs who didn't really get thwarted in the same way by mm-hmm. uh, COVID quarantine and stuff, folks who had more experience working remotely and could make that pivot uh, much more easily they're all now getting spotlighted because the big publishers um, and consoles, they don't have their own stuff to spotlight. So they're spotlighted. So it's just like, I feel like we're getting overwhelmed with information about very cool indie games. And there's just too, it can't, I can't play it all. I, know, I can't I just, play it all. It hurts so bad. I want to. And part of like my brain, like feels like I should be able to, because I don't have a big game that's keeping me away from it. But that mm. just doesn't really track with the fact that like, there's only so many hours in the day. And even though these are smaller games in general, like I still can't play three dozen of them. <laughs> yeah. What were some of the games you wanted to highlight though? It's all just, it's all so much. Um, well, one game I wanted to talk about, um, the, Demo just came out. It's actually free on itch.io, um, but you can also, of course, donate to the developers or pay uh, what you can or what you'd like. Um, but this game is called Path of Kami, and it's developed by Capitalite. Um, in Path of Kami, you follow the spirit of a Japanese wolf named Kazayo as he navigates the trials of the mortal and spiritual world in the form of puzzles. You solve puzzles and discover secrets um, with the creative uses of your spirit fire powers, and you explore snowy landscapes while finding collectibles and hidden areas. Um, I wanted to just spotlight it because um, it's from a really cool, really diverse uh, women-led team. Um, the studio, Capitolite, um, they create uh, really narrative-driven, thought-provoking, emotional games. Um, and they're really trying to inspire passion in gamers for approaching games from, um, you know, I think similar to how we approach games as art, as therapy, as a hobby. Mm-hmm. Um, they really seem to be about that as well. Um, and the, just the creator, Diana Galbraith, uh, seems really cool. Um, she's been a game developer for a long time and founded Capitolite with a small team. Um, And she's just out here hustling, doing the work and um, has put forth a really adorable game um, that I can't play. It's currently only (laughs) available on Windows Mm. um, computers, but I just wanted to shout it out. Um, It looks really sweet. I can't wait to see how the game continues to develop um, and definitely encourage folks to look up Path of Kami um, from Capitolite on itch.io and game jolt Very um cool. and then one more game i wanted to highlight <laughs> is called dark city so dark city is a visual novel video game from 4615 theater company um which is based in maryland here in the u.s 
Um, it's really exciting because, like, I just love this idea of theater companies making games because mm-hmm. theater is such a, uh, you know, physically present and um, sort of immediate Mm-hmm. space mm-hmm. and it's the idea of sort of um you know the same folks sort of creating and imagining those worlds um then shifting to this um you know completely digital um creation that can exist endlessly but also be its own singular experience uh, it's just a really cool <laughs> it's cool mm-hmm. <laughs> um and dark city has uh been put together by a team of queer and trans, black and indigenous people of color. It was directed and written by Gregory Kung Strasser and with art and design by Sarah Askandari, um, two folks that you may hear from again. Who knows? Mm, what does Ooh. that mean? <laughs> oh, maybe a future guest. <laughs> but more about the game. Um, so let me just read the little, little bio, get, get you all uh, excited about it. <laughs> Before his big sister died, Judah had it all, an education, job prospects, and a gorgeous apartment in Aeola City's hippest district. But in a matter of a year, everything was taken from him. Haunted by his sister's murder and frustrated by the city's tepid response, he leaves altogether, trying to move on. But when an investigative journalist from an indigenous tribe shows up on his doorstep, looking into his sister's role at her former employer, the Aeolus Investment Organization, new revelations emerge. What did his sister know? What is the AIO planning for the city's future? From the shadowy underbelly of the city to the highest echelons of power, Judah uncovers a scandal so massive that nearly everyone may have had a part to play in it. So it seems like this just really cool sort of choose your own adventure, noir, detective, meets solar punk, colorful, like present day, like diverse narratives. And I just, mm-hmm. I don't know, it just came out. Um, you can find it at 4615theaterco.itch.io. Um, it's free to play. The first chapter is out now. Of course, you can make a donation of your choice, um, but I highly recommend folks check out Dark City. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to playing that one. Got it downloaded. Hell yeah. Okay, I feel like I've talked about like so many games and I have so many more I could talk about, but Jamie, um, <laughs> what are you playing? And what do you have to talk about to, with us today? <laughs> sure. Uh, I am, I definitely, as I said, I feel you on the like, there's just too many games to play. I think between, uh, you know, in our last episode, we talked about how we both just purchased houses and uh, I had been dealing with moving. You're dealing with like contractors and getting things set up at the house and Soon you'll be yeah. dealing with moving. So you're preparing for moving and it's just digging mailbox posts, <laughs> digging mailbox posts. Um, you know, I've been, I'm trying to go grass in my yard. That's been a project. Um, mm. And, you know, just work and everything else. So yeah. it just, and the world, and it just doesn't feel like there's, I haven't had mental capacity to really sit down and invest in a game, but I'm starting to get back to there. And now mm. I'm just feeling overwhelmed by how much stuff there is to play. So, the main thing that I wanted to talk about today that I've been using uh, to unwind is this uh, little game called Cozy Grove. Oh my gosh. Uh, that may be on some folks' radar already. Uh, so Cozy Grove is, uh, it's one of those, I, I guess you could call it a farming sim. I would say it's kind of like mm. a cross between uh, Animal Crossing and a more traditional farming sim. I, I, I but the closest comparison point is probably Animal Crossing, and I'll, I'll kind of get into that more in a second. Um, it was released on March 19th of this year, developed by Spry Fox. Um, you can get it on most platforms. I do think this one was also on Apple Arcade, um, so you can get it on your iPhones, I believe. And I think that's what it was originally developed for, which makes a lot of sense based on some of the stuff I'm mm. encountering as I play it. But it's a... Game where you play as this person, uh, you make this little cartoon character um, who is called a spirit scout. And spirit scouts, they're kind of like um, like the like Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, uh, like you'd see. You know, uh, your character has a little uh, colorful vest on that has their little <laughs> merit badges. Um, but what spirit scouts are specifically trained to do is to help spirits um, fulfill their, you know, their kind of unfulfilled stuff before they move on to the land of the mm. dead. So spirits that are kind of lingering 
in this world, um, helping them find some closure and moving on. So the spirit scouts as part of their training, they're sent out into the world to find spirits to help pass on. Uh, however, you as a little spirit scout, you accidentally uh, crash your boat on this island called Cozy Grove that no one has been to in a very long time and no oh. spirit scouts have visited. And uh, there's all of oh. these spirits on the island who have just been kind of trapped and left to languish um, on this oh, on this gosh. island, neglected and forgotten about by time, right? So it's got oh. this really, I, I think, one of the most interesting narratives that I've experienced in a game like this. I think like the core mm. uh, concept is very cool. Um, and very interesting, the idea of interacting with these characters and, and helping them achieve closure and and uh, come to terms with like things in their life before they move on. It's just, it's just a really neat idea. Does that totally bear out an execution? <laughs> I don't mm. I don't know. Sometimes it works for me and sometimes it doesn't. The thing I find is so I said this was like an Animal Crossing clone because you are. You're doing things, you essentially have villagers. Essentially on the island, these spirits function as your villagers. They mm. are not at random, at least I don't believe so. I believe they're all like scripted characters who appear mm. in a set order. Uh, they're all represented as bears, <laughs> but some <laughs> of them are like, like the first bear that you meet, like she's essentially a camp counselor who kind of like runs the camp on the island. Um, yeah. You meet the mayor bear, you meet the postal bear, <laughs> but there's also a bear who... Um, presents initially as though she's carved out of wood and oh. she believes that she's a tree. And eventually, like as days progress and you talk to her more, she comes to the realization that she was an artist in her life and that she carved with wood. Mm. And so like in her death, she'd become so far removed from her life that she believed herself to be a tree. Um, or there's another bear who was a sailor and he currently believes he's a seagull. So I don't know if he's eventually going to also realize he was a bear or so far he's still just a seagull for me. And I just met one who's represented as an ear of corn. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's got this. Country really girls <laughs> make do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's got this really cute uh, art style. And the interactions with the bears, the characters, the things that they say, um, like I've had some really, it's all very brief, mm. but it still has the capacity to be, I think, powerful. Uh, for example, there was an uh, interaction I had with the postal working bear um, who... Uh, he he said that a package had been delivered for him somewhere on the island and I had to go find it. And that's how a lot of the little quests that you get from the manifest, it's like, I'm looking for a thing, go find it. And you'll get kind of a hint, like this thing is going to be by a large tree stump. And as you mm -hmm. get to know the island, you kind of know where that might be. But it's a lot of it is kind of like, um, almost like a Where's Waldo. <laughs> like you're looking at this like very intricate image and trying mm -hmm. to find this tiny little leaf or this tiny little package on the screen. Mm -hmm. So that aspect of it, I, I don't know, like, I, en I enjoy it in the sense that it's, like, something to do to make my brain smooth, but it's not yeah. necessarily, like, fun <laughs> gameplay. Mm. But so I find the package for the bear. I bring it back to him, and it's a soccer ball. And he says, but this is a very heavy soccer ball. And it's it's he you, you kind of realize from what he's saying that it's heavy with emotional weight. Oh. And the next day when you visit him, he said the soccer ball like sat on his chest all night and oh, kept God. him from sleeping. But I'd still I don't have like more story yet about the soccer ball. But clearly there's something serious that happened that ties back to the soccer ball in his life that he's like not ready to share with me yet. Did someone kill him with a soccer ball? <laughs> I, I don't think it'll be that grim. I, well, I guess it could be. Gr I think it has more to do. Like I know he has kids and a family. So I'm wondering if it has something to do mm. with his his family. Right. Right. But the way the game plays out is that it's meant to be played every day for oh. a short period of time. And the game will actually kind of tell you, like, every day you, I turn it on, I go interact with all of the characters that are on the island. At this point, there's like six or seven of them. And then, like, as the game progresses, I'm unlocking more and more characters. But I go interact with each one. They'll give me a quest for the day. Mm -hmm. I'll do that quest for them. <clears throat> uh Depending on the nature of the quest, I might get rewarded with currency. I might get rewarded with more items. I might get rewarded with an upgraded tool, like a shovel. Um, mm -hmm. Or uh, if it's a story that progress, if it's an interaction that progresses the overall story of the game, I'll get rewarded with what's called a spirit log, 
which I bring back to my home base campfire. And as you feed spirit logs to your campfire, that's what like uh, actually pushes the narrative of the game forward. Mm-hmm. So you're, every time uh, your fire eats a certain number of spirit logs, it expands the size of the island mm-hmm. and adds another character to the game for you to interact with. But mm-hmm. your fire might need 10 logs you're not even going to necessarily get one log a day. So it might take several days for you to get all of those logs for your fire and then expand mm-hmm. the island and then add a new character. And there's no way for you, you to progress beyond what the game has set for that day on a given day. It really is a game that's meant to be played for 20 to 90 minutes a day to check in and update your things and touch base with all the characters. And then it literally, you'll go back to the fire and you'll ask him like, what do I do next? And he goes, well, there's no more logs out there for today. So come back tomorrow. Like it literally tells you like, you're done for the day. There's something about that that I actually kind of like. um, Because I think, you know, something I ran into with Animal Crossing, like I could just sit there and lose an entire day to Animal Crossing. Mm -hmm. Um, And and then I wouldn't play anything else or, or, or Stardew. Right, you do the same yeah. thing with Stardew. You because you can just keep going and keep going and keep advancing, um, and, and eventually I would I would I would run out of steam on the game because I would be like, well, I'm not I'm not really getting like all I'm getting out of this is brain smooth, right. so I right. need something else too. And and I think what's nice about Cozy Grove is I can unwind with it and then move on to something else, and that it feels like it's giving me a good stopping point each day to do that. Yeah, like it sort of puts a structure in place to mm-hmm. make sure you're sort of engaging <laughs> healthily with it. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong, like we've talked about, there's nothing wrong with with binging a game, but I do find that with something like Stardew, it's almost like I'll wake up uh, after a week and be like, oh man, I, I, I wish I could go back and just luxuriate more of the time <laughs> with, when uh, there was still story to discover and, and items to unlock. Now I'm just, I've, I've just taken it all in so much and so quickly that uh, you just get to the point where, as you said, you just you just keep going, keep going, even if there's no more um, really to accomplish. Um, and so I like the way the game sort of spaces itself out. Mm-hmm. Um, I could see how you could really keep a player retained long, like you could make it just a part of your ongoing yeah uh, play. Yeah, and the other thing I. L- <laughs> So I said I do have some issues with the game. I think one of my okay. Hold up, before you get into the issues, yes. you didn't mention that your sentient campfire is named Flamey. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, the sentient campfire <laughs> is named Flamey, and he definitely <laughs> reminds me of the um, shoot. What's the name of the fire in Howl's Moving Castle? Oh, Calcifer. That is, Calcifer. That is exactly like I'm hearing as Billy Crystal who yeah. voices him in May the all English your bacon burn. Yes, I'm absolutely. I mean, there's no voice acting in the game. It's all just text yeah. on a screen um, with the really delightful like heartwarming soundtrack i get the little songs like stuck in my head they're just so cute and soothing (laughs) but uh but yeah i definitely envision him as calcifer and hear billy (laughs) when he like he's talking to me i'm hearing billy crystal he definitely is very reminiscent of calcifer but yes flamey i'm sorry for not mentioning flamey amazing i'm (laughs) flamey shout out to flamey you're the one who's like okay we're done for the day (laughs) (laughs) go do something else and leave me alone yeah (laughs) Um, no, okay, so my main issue with the game is that it does there well, there's two things. First of all, the game has a decoration aspect, like you're constantly collecting these decorations, and the decorations actually they have more function than I think they do in a game like Animal Crossing, because the decorations all have these different descriptors. So for example, I might get a picnic table. That picnic table is common and rustic. Mm. All right. It's got these two features. Uh, You can get uh, animals to take care of in the game. So far, I've just found birds, but a bird. uh, Well, you get animals and you get plants to take Mm. care of. And so far, it's been birds and flowers that I found. They all have things that they like and dislike. The flowers? The flowers and the birds. (laughs) Jeez. So if a bird likes rustic items, placing the bird next to a rustic item makes him happier. Oh God, the four on <laughs> fauna are judging your <laughs> furniture choices. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, it's a little funny, but it also like makes the decoration feel like it has more of a use, right? Like I'm going to set up a rustic picnic area and then I'm going to put some of the birds and the plants that like the rustic things around then it's going to mm. make them happy and it's going to make them like 
when I feed the bird, he's going to give me an egg now because he's totally happy and fulfilled with his life. Um, and the flower is going to produce more, uh, more bulbs to harvest, right? Mm. That kind of a deal. Um, so unlike Animal Crossing, where you're literally just decorating for the benefit of decorating, like yeah. here it's got a use. But the problem cool. is, is that first of all, you get overwhelmed with these decorations. Mm. I don't think the inventory system is well managed at all. It's so hard to get extra capacity to store things like the game really doesn't want you to hang on to things. And yet it simultaneously gives you a lot of tasks that require you to save items for multiple days at a time. For example, baking requires a shitload of eggs. And eggs are hard to come by until you build up a plethora of birds. So you need to be able to store your eggs. So it's got this weird like thing where it's like it both wants you to not be spending a lot of time farming and harvesting and like hoarding things. Right. But it also you kind of have to do that to be able to fulfill requests in a timely manner. So it, it doesn't yeah. seem to be very balanced in that mm. regard. Um, which is frustrating. And then in addition to that, the decorations, like they just end up feeling crowded. Like I'm not decorating for an aesthetic reason. I, they've become purely functional now. It's almost leaning too far in that direction. And when you walk up near your decorations, because it's got this like isometric kind of flat perspective, yeah. the decorations, trees, things in the environment disappear so that you can see around everything so that you can find all the items that they're hiding that you have to find to fulfill the other quests. So you can't even really, if you were decorating for an aesthetic perspective, you can't really enjoy it because as soon as you walk up next to it, it disappears so that you can see around it. <gasps> what if you were the ghost character. the whole time? <laughs> well, you know, that may be. I don't know. I'll Conspiracy. have to play. I think similar to The Longing, this is a game you'd have to play for about a year to see the real <laughs> end of it. So, yeah. Wow. Where I do think it succeeds is is in something that I think is... I think you can get out of Stardew and I think is kind of knit into Animal Crossing, which is like a very, the, both of those games have like really strong capitalist elements. Mm -hmm. Stardew, I think you can choose to play that more for enjoyment and not lean so hard. But I definitely, when I play Stardew, I go full like capitalist farmer and I'm maximizing my revenue and my efficiency. And, and that's definitely like a way you can play that game and that it, I don't know if it encourages you to play it, but it certainly makes it very available to you. Yeah, like I, I, yeah, like I feel like with Stardew, it's, it's very much giving you the choice. Like, there's the very physical representation of there's the Joja Mart, which is like the Amazon corporate stand-in, and right next door mm -hmm. is Pierre's, the family-run general store. And through the process of you know rebuilding the community center, I think it is putting forth a path where you are someone who is all about mutual aid and trading and taking care of the community and 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 having a sovereign community that takes care of itself. But at the same time, uh, it doesn't stop you if you want to play as a very like profit driven, optimizing all your, all your tiles, you know, all the way up to, you know, getting rid of Pierre's and leaning fully into the Jojo Mart thing, mm -hmm. but but yeah, it very much leaves it <laughs> up to you. Yeah, but and I think like even if you like, who the fuck plays the Jojo Mart path? Like you're a monster. <laughs> what kind of monster? Get the are hell you? out of here! But yeah. you can st you cannot choose the Jojo Mart path and still be like very much yeah. not playing that game, like a re relaxing little community building game. <laughs> For like, sure, you can definitely uh, take that path. And then similarly, I think you know Animal Crossing. <laughs> Tom Nook's a fucking landlord. Like, yeah, <laughs> the dude's constantly like pushing loans onto you that you're. He's like not fully disclosing, right. and then like forcing you to pay him back all these bills. Which I definitely think you know you can make the argument it's like useful for kids in particular to like understand like how to pay something back over time. Sure, sure. Um, but it's I. I mean, I'm kind of joking. I don't think like Animal Crossing is destroying the world with its capitalist <laughs> perspective. Even story of even story of seasons, the new Olive Town uh, partners of Olive Town, like it's very much about attracting tourists to the island and, mm -hmm. and building more businesses to attract more tourists. So yeah, I, I definitely get those vibes. Yeah. So I guess what I appreciate about Cozy Grove is I think it's done a good job of there is still a currency in the game of these. They're called old coins hmm. um, that you can use to to buy and uh, to buy stuff from this like fox vendor that's set up on the town. And then there's like a weekly traveling vendor that shows up that you can use the coins to buy stuff from him. But it the way you earn the coins is not. Like I can take the bulbs from my plants 
and I can find shells on the beach. And those are kind of the two items that I can bring to the fox and sell. That's not really how I've like, quote unquote, made money in the game. The primary way that I have like banked money in the game is by getting it for helping people. Uh, Both the bears will sometimes Mm. reward you with coins when you do their quests. You can get coins from the, the seagull bear. He also kind of runs a like a museum sort of a thing, almost like the owl and animal crossing um, where anytime you come across a new item that you've never seen before in the game, if you choose to donate it to the bear, you might get rewarded with some coins. Hmm. Uh, And then the final primary way that I've gotten them is there's these creatures called imps that are kind of running around on the Island that will run from you if you come near them. But if you Mm -hmm. see one standing by itself, it will have like a little bubble over its head of something that it really wants. And sometimes it'll be crying. It's so sad. (gasps) And if you take the item that it wants and you throw it to it, it'll pick it up and it'll get really happy and a little heart will appear. And sometimes when you run over and click on them, like coins will appear, but you you're get you're always getting them for doing something nice for someone as opposed to like, it's not really reliable relying on this system of like selling. Mm. So I just think that's interesting how it's kind of managed to, and I'm not, I, like I said, I'm getting all these decorations, but I'm putting them everywhere on the island. That's the other thing. Like Animal Crossing, so much of it feels focused on like hoarding and having mm-hmm. so many, just so much shit. Like you're just constantly getting shit for your house. And because the decorations in Cozy Grove feel like so, like they're just more functional and I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of divorced itself from this idea of like trying to, it's trying to push back on the idea of hoarding resources and getting money by like yeah being really intense and hoarding and selling so i think that's cool i really appreciate this concept of sort of you know giving you giving the player a reward for when they d- demonstrate empathy or mm-hmm. um help someone instead of like you said the sort of super transactional nature um like sort of divorcing the coins from making it all about building wealth and i mean maybe it's still about that but i don't know i I like that yeah (laughs) yeah so that's cozy grove um i'm playing a few other things but i think we'll leave it at that for today and switch over to our lovely interview that we have for everyone uh very excited about this one as we always are but yeah i mean everyone's my favorite but (laughs) this has definitely been one of my favorites also (laughs) (laughs) Uh, our guest for you today is writer poet artist and communications professional ungbeen salim ungbeen works as a digital communications coordinator for north star fund uh, which is a social justice fund based in new york that supports grassroots fundraising you'll hear a bit more about that uh organization at the end of the episode in our side quest. Um, but Ungbeen's also worked in communications for MTV, and we do touch on that a bit in the interview. Uh, what drew us initially to her as a potential guest for Pixel Therapy, though, is her experience with video games as a source of learning for how she creates her art. Ungbeen told us that playing video games taught her a lot about writing poetry and being a creative person in general. And we really uh, dig in with her in the interview about how, you know, in our white supremacy culture of perfectionism Mm -hmm. that we exist in, particularly here in the U.S., Mm -hmm. uh, we're not really taught the value of failing or how to experiment or how to just be okay with letting yourself practice something to get better at it. I know it's, it's something we've talked about on the podcast. It's something I struggle with personally a lot, too. And so the conversation just really resonated with us. We hope it will resonate with you all as well. So without further ado, here's our interview with Ungbeen Salim. So hello to our wonderful guest, and thank you so much for joining us in the virtual pixel therapy studio. To start, we typically ask guests to let us know um, what's your name and pronouns. Yeah, my name is Angbin Salim, and my pronouns are she and her. And Angbin, how do you spend your time? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I spend, I mean, I spend a lot of time working, but um, in a lot of my free time, I love to bake, I love to write and read, and recently mm. I've been playing a lot of games, um, which is mm. part of the reason I'm here. Um, and I also like doing nail art, which I've picked up during quarantine. <gasps> 
where can I, where can I, where can we all follow your <laughs> nail art? <laughs> I mean, it's all, everything is in the same Instagram because I'm too lazy to have multiple Instagrams, but you can follow <laughs> me there on, it's angry bean, but spelled with an I, not a Y. Oh my God. I just want to note that as an overwhelmed millennial, I completely, I'm very validated to hear that it's just too much energy to do multiple Instagram accounts. Like it's overwhelming. So no. I'm with you. I support that. <laughs> I also do my works Instagram. So I'm like, two is enough. Mm-hmm. That's all. That's all mm-hmm. I need to do. If you don't want to see me at my food posting, then you don't deserve me at my top tier nail art posting. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting it all. <laughs> I contain multitudes. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and Ang Bean, I saw that um, you used to work with MTV's social impact department. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that um, because the I just was looking up uh, what that department does and um, they really try to bring messages around social issues um, to young people and connecting young people um, to what's going on in the world around them through MTV's like various digital and Mm -hmm. on-air platforms. Um, What did that kind of work look like? Like, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on like the role of media in social change and connecting people to that. Yeah, it was definitely an an interesting experience because I think part of it had to do with like um, educating our peers as well as our mm. audiences and being like, this is why this work is important. This is why we have to say something about, um, you know, the the Charlottesville um, riot, whatever you want to call it, um, that happened a few years ago. This is why we have to say something about Black History Month. I mean, Black History Month less so because it's become like so normalized for brands mm. to want to put out messages of support now. Mm -hmm. Um, in kind of a weird and disgusting way. (laughs) (laughs) For better or for worse. For better or for worse, yeah. Um, So I think it was was really, um, it was a really challenging experience in some ways because I had Mm. come from like a very social justice-y background where like it felt like most of us were on the same page and to go to Mm -hmm. someplace where it was like, okay, we're actually like kind of on different pages now and like how to communicate that um, with each other. And like, you know, it's also like also an awkward task to like go Mm -hmm. to the social media, the MTV social media team and be like, Hey guys, can you take a break from posting about, Kylie Jenner today Mm -hmm. and like post this post this one thing about um reproductive health like it's Mm -hmm. you know it's like a little because they're like how does this connect like our audience Mm -hmm. wants to read about you know Harry Styles and Zayn Malik um so it's like the algorithm uh, exactly but the algorithm they Mm -hmm. want celebrities so it's it it, it's kind of a a tension there for sure and Mm. one that's very still very difficult and interesting to navigate I think Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I like working in kind of alt weekly journalism where I would be covering like fellow queer people of color and trans folks in Boston and then advocating for like attacking institutions for being racist and being shitty and then moving into a more corporate environments like and having to navigate like like I feel like it's in some ways harder to deal with the kind of bigotry that isn't as overt and is more like a product of Mm -hmm. generationally ingrained like white supremacist ideals that are not even like may not be on the surface, but operating subconsciously in people. Like I think that really manifests in corporate culture and and in this quote unquote, like professionalism Mm -hmm. Um, and advocating for like, of course, just speaking to my own experience as a, I'm a mixed race Filipino trans person, um, like having to work with people who are like, Oh, I'm an ally. Like, I'm not mm-hmm. racist. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you're you're racist for calling mm-hmm. me racist. Like, mm. I how can I? How do I know what I don't know? Like, I'm just like I'm. I didn't mean it that way. Like, if you mm-hmm. came towards me with and embraced and and educated me, then I could be mm-hmm. a better ally instead of pushing me away. Like, that's the kind of bullshit mm-hmm. <laughs> that you have to learn. Like, 
there's just kind of constant dehumanization that can kind of come with doing right. that work. Yeah. Um, and so I apologize for the kind of flippancy with which I first approached that question. No, and I thank no, you for, um, you know, being real about that. Cause like, that shit's hard. <laughs> yeah. And I also like want to, I want to be open about the whole situation. Cause on one hand it was really exciting to like have mm-hmm. this huge audience and be like, we can, young people are amazing and young people do want to talk about social justice issues. So like, you know, we did like Muslim women's day and we like featured music videos by a lot of Muslim women. And I'm like, that's cool. Like we did Mm -hmm. that. And like a lot of the Muslim women we featured, they're not, I mean, I think they're bigger artists now, but they weren't huge back then. And they were like so happy to see themselves on MTV. Like MTV is such a, is such a, is a brand that like so many people love and like, have held on to through their use. And so to be featured by MTV in any way is just like so exciting, um, regardless of like all of the bullshit that's happening in the background. So I think there, there was a lot of powerful work that we were able to do while I was Mm -hmm. there. It was also just challenging sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And it shouldn't have to be like special interests that, that prompt these posts or like of current events, uh, making white people have to be more aware of racism than they normally have to at this point in time. Like it, that shit needs to be normalized. We need to stop seeing whiteness as a default. Um, Mm -hmm. You mentioned when we were first connecting that you're a new gamer. Um, and before we get into the, like the specific games you're playing, mm-hmm. I was curious to know, like, what's your personal history with video games just in general? Yeah. You know, I was actually reflecting on that this week. I'm like, am I a new gamer, actually? Because I'm <laughs> <Yeah>. like, <laughs> like, when I think about it, I'm like, I grew up, like, I played these silly, like, third grade computer games that help you do math and like Mm -hmm. learn I played those I was obsessed with roller coaster tycoon for the longest time (laughs) (laughs) I like what played for years and I was like building the craziest theme parks and drowning people Mm -hmm. um, in in the game in the game Um, (laughs) uh, and so like I played that for a really long time I played a lot of mobile games um there, and like I had a Sega Genesis, which I bought 10 years after the Sega Genesis came out because it was only $25 and it was like what I could afford. <laughs> yes. Um, so I had that. Like, so there's all these ways that I'm like, oh, yeah, like I have been playing games, but it never I felt like I wasn't allowed to be a gamer in a way or I felt like I couldn't identify with that, especially like the more. I don't know what to call it, but like the more combat style games mm. that, uh, that like I feel like is considered real gaming. Um, those are those were very hard for me. And I also didn't have the I don't I also didn't have anything like like I said, mm-hmm. all I had was a Sega Genesis. I never the only time I got to play with a GameCube or Nintendo 64 was when I visited a friend or a mm. cousin. And like even then I was so bad at it because I didn't get a lot of practice. Right. Um, uh, so yeah, so I'm like, uh, am I a new gamer? I've been I've been thinking about that a lot. Oh, that's so true. It's like, like I, I feel like there were periods of time in my own life where I feel like games had a bigger role and then a smaller role, and it, and it had to do with like access or like the money I had at the time or the spaces I was living in. Um, but when I look back over my life, there are all of these these artifacts, like you mentioned, like oh this this system that I had, and and I have these vivid memories of these games I would play mm-hmm. with certain people in certain settings, and um, it's just interesting looking back, like what pops to mind. Um, yeah. So now, like, do you use the word gamer to describe yourself? Like, how does that feel? Like, what does it mean to you to be a gamer? Yeah, I I do use it to describe myself because I spend so much of my time thinking about gaming and, like, Mm -hmm. watching people stream and playing games. Um, And it's something I'm, like, proud of now. Um, 
I think it's funny, like, you know, quarantine has led me into discovering so many things that I didn't really know that I wanted to do. Like, mm. I hated putting on nail polish uh, when I was a kid <laughs> because I could never wait for it to dry mm. and then it would get everywhere. And I was just like, fuck this shit. Yes. Don't want to, don't want, <laughs> don't want to do this. Like, why do people do this? And then for some reason, like a few months after quarantine started, I was like, nail polish is so cool and nail art is so cool mm -hmm. and I started doing like my nails weekly um and it's I have also, time now to watch paint dry <laughs> <laughs> I have time to watch paint dry also need time not to look at my cell phone yeah um, oh. mm -hmm. and like <laughs> it's really good for that um and also it's just like it's a way to be creative in a year where I did not feel like being creative. Like last year I did very little creativity. Um, so it felt like, okay, I still have some creative juices in me and this is how they need to come out. And that's kind of how I feel about gaming. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's something that I've always been interested in and that I saw from afar, but I just felt like I didn't have access to it in certain ways. And because of quarantine, because I'm at home, like, it's like, oh, like, this is something I like, genuinely like love doing and love thinking about. And it's something that's, you know, brought up, it's just brought like people together, my friends and I, we have like, our Among Us game nights on Fridays. And like, I get to see my friends every Friday night, um, which is really fun. And so there's all these like other benefits that I found to like, coming into this, not so new, new hobby, I guess. Mm -hmm. Plus it's like, I like zoom fatigue has been so real mm -hmm. for me. Like it feels like the last thing I want to do is get on zoom. Even not because I don't want to see my friends, but just because I, I think like, and I know I'm not the first person to think about this. I'm sure many people smarter than me have written about it. But there's this aspect of of constant surveillance that I feel like is mm. built into Zoom. Like you can't really be you because you're forced to look at yourself the entire time and be hyper aware of how others are seeing you, even in moments of rest. Like you're not constantly talking in a meeting. You're sitting there listening to others. Maybe you're looking yeah. at your phone. Maybe yeah. you're zoning out for a minute. <laughs> um, like people aren't made to pay attention for an hour plus constantly. Yeah. But Zoom forces you to even be aware of yourself in those moments where in mm. real life, in person, you wouldn't be on. Yeah. Um, and I feel like games sort of take the pressure of that off, like group gaming. Mm -hmm. Like I never really, um, like of course when I went to parties, we'd play the Jackbox game. Like for folks who aren't familiar, it's like these mobile games, like quizzes and things that you can play at parties with friends on your mobile phones or devices. Um, but now like with games like Among Us, we've been, been playing, um, there's a browser version of Settlers of Catan, the board game. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> it. Like you're still sharing space, you're still running around together, you're still talking, there's an activity, but there's something about the removal of having to be necessarily like on mm -hmm. that, that kind of replicates the feeling I get hanging with friends where I don't have to be on in the same way that yeah. I have to work. Yeah, yeah. No, that's so real. And I think part of the onness is like, you know, what, what do I s talk about with my friends? Like, uh, for me, a lot of weeks, there's not a lot new happening. Um, <laughs> it's like, unless you want to hear about some like weird esoteric art film I just watched, like, <laughs> yeah. I don't have a lot to say to you. Um, so it's like, but like the game, the gaming experience just like gives you a way to like come together without, um, without like that pressure you said of like performance of like, giving updates it's like no wh what we're doing together is the update mm -hmm. and that's like what's bringing me closer to you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what we're doing together is what generates the the in jokes and the yes, the conversation yes. that later <laughs> creates the memory that we look back on yes, together yes exactly yeah 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 exactly <laughs> So 
Hong Bean, is it fair to say that you're a poet? Like, can it we say that? It is fair to say that, yes. <laughs> it's, it's a recent thing I've picked up, but I think it's fair to say that. Okay, so I was definitely reading a few of your poems before you came on the show, um, and I was really struck by, I mean, I love them all, but there were a couple that I wanted to point out specifically. One was... Um, was called Mad Lib for the Apocalypse, and the other was called Anti Jalebi. Mm-hmm. Um, so on this show, we've spoken a lot lately about how narrative design, like in video games, isn't just about dialogue, isn't just about the text you see on the screen. Um, like it's also about the way narrative is crafted through image and and movement and sound and everything else that goes into the creation of a game. Um, and in your poems, and specifically the two that I just mentioned, I love the ways that you sort of play with shape and form, like pushing it into unexpected places that really change how the viewer, the reader interacts with the words. Um, and also kind of like gamifying the experience of the mm. poem itself in a way. Um, and ante... And, Auntie Jalebi, um, you're following like this twisty, curving, endlessly looping path. Um, to me, this sort of mirrors like the push and pull and constant like uh, like expectations, cultural from like I come from an immigrant family and there's lots like this just constant, you can get pulled into this vortex of just like uh, judgment and feeling and all these expect and guilt and, and all of the things. Um, and then in Mad Lib for the Apocalypse, um, you have this really cool juxtaposition of this, um, you know, like a Mad Lib, a child's like sentence generating game um, with these really deeply like existential and personal prompts that really um, make you just pause as you're, as you're taking in the poem. Um, and so like, these are two really cool, like, visual examples. Has your poetry always looked like this? Like, how did you, um, how, tell us about your, your practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. It hasn't always looked like this. Um, I'm, I'm at, like, the, something happened. I took a class with Angel Nafis, who's like one of the best poets I know and like an amazing teacher. And something happened in the class where we were, um, reading, we were reading books because the class was about coming up with your own manuscript. So we were reading whole books of poems and like thinking about our poetry, not just as a poem, but as a book. Mm. And I think something happened in that class where I was like, oh, like, I was just seeing so many different things of people like pushing the limits of what a poem is or could be and like thinking about the book. So like the, the, po the Mad Lib actually came about this hasn't happened, but the thought I had was, would it, wouldn't it be kind of cool to have a whole book of poems that was like a workbook mm. and like, or like, that's maybe like putting too much work, but like <laughs> into it, I'm like workbook doesn't sound good, but like something that was like more interactive where you mm. were like actually there with the reader together. Um, and like one of my friends, Jennifer, she wrote a poem that was like um, a choose your own adventure style poem. And I was like, isn't that cool? Like we could, we could do that. And I think like now playing games, I'm especially with like Breath of the Wild. I'm like, mm -hmm. what if there was a poetry book where you could choose where you started the book? Um, like, obviously you can choose where you start the book with any book. You can flip to whatever page, but like, how could you like force that experience in a way? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I've come up with that the idea yet, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but it's something I've been thinking about a lot is like, where can you have moments of interaction with the reader where it's not just about yourself? And I guess part of it comes from an uncomfortability with just talking about myself mm -hmm. and not acknowledging that other people are here in the room with me. Mm. Um, so I've been, I've been thinking about that a lot. And I think with Auntie Jalebi, I don't, so a Jalebi is actually a sweet um, mm. and it's like a spirally sweet. So the mm. poem is m modeled after that and like the kind of sweetness and like, how do you use form to capture what you're actually saying? Cause I think if mm. the, if you actually had the poem just as like, stanzas I feel like it would be very it would it's not that great of a poem <laughs> not that it's not that great of a poem but it's a very simple poem um mm -hmm. and but I think this the adding of that form make propels it to be something else and like other people connect with it because of that reason um so yeah just thinking about how to expand 
how to expand forms is like really exciting for me. Wonderful. I that makes me think of. I really love this idea of um, identifying places where you can introduce interactivity between the poet and the reader. It makes me think about um, theater because mm. I feel like theater is this impossible to recreate experience, but also it. So like I see theater as taking film further because in film, you're not there in the room. Like like the way we were talking about how in-person meetings are different from Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. It's like being in a space physically with other people and and experiencing in real time um, how these emotions and 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 things are playing out like it creates a wholly different living organic ex- organic experience with a story than you would get from just watching a film where someone else is controlling every aspect of how you're taking in that story mm-hmm. um and similarly i feel like with games it takes theater a step further because like you are fully immersed mm-hmm. like in that story you are that person you are becoming this avatar. And um, I think the further we get into the future with games, especially with VR, like I feel like even more so they're going to become truly these other realities, these other worlds that we are Mm -hmm. fully able to submerge ourselves into. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I really like the way that you're thinking about poetry with that interactivity too, because like, I feel like it can be ways of bringing these art forms further. Mm -hmm. Um, Not that poetry on its own or writing on its own, not not to discredit any individual form of art. Not at all, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> don't want to, don't want all the poets coming after me. <laughs> Listen. Exactly. The poet lobby is canceling me. <laughs> this is just a new idea, not necessarily a better idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's this quote from the poet Juan Felipe Herrera, and he once explained that language generally moves in two directions towards the page like what the poet writes in ink and off the page, what readers hear when they read Mm. the ink. Um, I like this question. I like this, uh, like, I like this quote um, because I really feels like it's, it speaks to the kind of movement in poetry that, that we were sort of talking about um, and the interaction between like the content of what we're taking in from a poem, mm-hmm. as well as how the poem is like visually striking us. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's true for, for your poems, especially like there's the words themselves, but there's also the way the shape influences how we're taking in those words. Um, and I feel like you spoke about this a little bit, but like when you're, with with the poems that are taking shape like that, like, um, do you see how it's going to look in your head before it comes to paper, or it does the process of creating the poem uh, influence the shape? Like, how do you think about movement in your poetry? Mm, that's a really good question. I mean, I think it kind of depends from poem to poem. And I think um, the quote you read is so essential, even as a writer, because I think what I hear from my poetry teachers all the time and what I've also experienced is when you read the poem out loud, that's like when you're actually experiencing and feeling the poem in your body and like Mm. actually understanding what to change. And like, it's crazy. Like, it's so wild to me that like on the page I'm like, yeah, this, this looks like a good poem. And then I read it out loud and I'm like, Mm. why is that there? Like, why, why, why this should be switched around. And suddenly like things start to change. And I'm like, that's really wild. If you think Mm. about it, that like sounds versus image, like can change so much. And I think like, like I said before, it kind of varies from poem to poem because sometimes the shape feels very obvious. And then other Mm. times it's like kind of what you're used, you put the poem in the form that you're used to. And then you're like, uh, like I said, like you're reading it or you have someone else read it and they're like, it feels like this kind of poem. It feels like Mm. it should be one stanza as opposed to three stanzas. Um, Just yesterday I had um, a session or yesterday, Friday, I had a session with uh, one of my teachers, Shira Ehrlichman, and she's also a brilliant, amazing poet. And um, we were going through one of my poems and she was like, what if this poem, like I had it in regular stanzas and she's like, what if this poem was really skinny and Mm. like was one long stanza and it completely changed the whole poem for me. And it, 
was like, oh, like, why did I include this sentence? It was about, it's kind of about, like, um, putting hair up on the shower. And, um, <laughs> it's a weird poem. Like, um, on the wall? Like, on the, the wall, shower? yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's about that, but, like, Long then I Long hair fam understands. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, but then, like, as I was... As I was changing it, I, I had included these lines about like being anemic and iron mm. pills, and I'm like, "Is that just something I wanted to say?" And I was mm. like, "This seems like a good place to put this here because this poem is dealing with hair and hair loss, mm. or is it actually necessary?" So I think that forces you to kind of think about the poem, the poem in different ways, and like think about like what shapes do I want to take and I think with both of the poems that you pointed out for for whatever reason I was like this is a poem I want to do I don't know why I want to do a poem in the shape of a jalebi and I want to <laughs> talk about like aunties who are sometimes rude to me but sometimes really sweet to me mm -hmm. um, and then I also want to do I, like I said, I had this idea for like doing like a workbook, quote unquote, and I was like, oh, it'd be so cool if a poem looked like a Mad Lib or mm. different kinds of like games that I played as a as a younger person. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it kind of depends on po from poem to poem, really. Mm -hmm. It makes me uh, like what you were saying about how just this whole conversation about words being different when you're reading them in your head versus saying it out loud and, and the form and how that influences how we take it in. It just reminded me of this uh, story I was reading. So this game recently came out uh, that we've talked about quite a bit on this podcast, but it's Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Mm -hmm. um, and are you familiar with the Assassin's Creed series? I know a little bit about it. I don't know a ton. Yeah. You know enough. But it's this, you know, set uh, in nor like what, what's period, like 800 or something, like early times, Vikings. Uh, and there's, uh, they're in England and essentially the point of this, just to give folks some random visual pictures to go with this, um, I was reading this interview with the composers of the game because the game has an incredible score. Um, I've been listening to it like while I'm working just cause it's kind of nice instrumental, but uh, occasionally epic backdrop, um, to my, my, uh, moving pixels around in my day to day. Um, but the composers talked about how they did not see the game for the mm. like two years that they worked on the, on the soundtrack. They were given like a drawing of the main character. They were given a couple paragraphs about what the game was about. And they were told, go off wow. and, and, and make us a soundtrack for a hundred plus hour game. <laughs> That's so wild. <laughs> but when it came together, it, the game, the, I, I like the experience of the game, like in writing about writings that I've read about the game, and this has been true for my experience as well. What has made the game unforgettable is not the story, is not the mechanics, is not the necessarily the incredible graphics. Mm -hmm. It's the quiet moments where you're traveling through this um, very expansive and beautifully detailed world, just accompanied by nothing but your horse and the music. Mm. Um, like this game is sort of unique in the Assassin's Creed series in that it has like Assassin's Creed has received flack in the past for having overwhelming maps. Like it's the type of RPG where you're dropped in and every single treasure, every single mission, every single point of interest like hundreds of little dots are covering your map and people are just mm. like oh my god like me too i was like this ah um, <laughs> but it's the first one to kind of introduce these big empty swaths of land which i think can be related to breath of the wild as well mm. um where you're just discovering it and traveling and accompanied mm -hmm. by this this gorgeous emotional music um mm. and i think that it's incredible that these uh composers didn't see the game, but mm. when the music and the game were put together, it created something unforgettable and yeah. something that could not, like the game would not stand alone on its own without that music. Um, yeah. And I just think that's it's really beautiful. So let's talk about Breath of the Wild since we, that's, that might be a good segue. Um, so first, how about if you were describing The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild to someone who'd never heard of it, never played it, what's a couple sentences, like how would you describe it? 
Okay, let me think about this. <laughs> I would describe it as a game where you are free to go wherever you want, do whatever you want to do, really. Um, and um, if you want to, like, if you want to, like, complete the mission, if you if you care about Princess Zelda at all, you you'll try to beat the Ganons or the bad guys. But if you don't want to do that, you really don't have to. Um, I think there's uh, a lot of ability to explore in the game um, that I find really beautiful. And what brought you to pick up Breath of the Wild? So one of my friends, he's been playing a lot of like PC games and um, he just got a PS5, but he had a Nintendo Switch and he was like, I'm not playing the Switch right now. I haven't played it in a few years. I'm focused on these PC games. I'm getting my PS5 games together. Do you want to just borrow it? Um, And like, here's the games I have. And I was like, okay, sure. Why not? Like I'm, I haven't played, I only have played Mario Kart and Mario Mm. party. And I was like, okay. And so I picked it up. And at first I actually played Mario Odyssey and I played through that. And I think that was also really fun. But then I was like, I want to play more games. And I was like, what is this breath of the wild thing? Mm. Like everyone keeps (laughs) talking about it. I have no, I like, the, the only image I have of Zelda is like back in the day when it was like 2D. Yeah. And like you, and like you were just. Ocarina of time. Yeah. yeah exactly. um, like I'm I, not even that, like further back. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, oh, you just like move through the world and it's going to be like my Aladdin Sega Genesis game. Oh, I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> um, like that's what I was imagining. And then when I started playing, I was like. First of all, I was very overwhelmed. I'm like, what? Where do I have to go? Because mm. like Mario Odyssey, it guides you through it. It's like you get the moons, and then you go to the next kingdom. <laughs> it's very obvious. But here, I was like, where do I go? I don't understand. Yeah. Um, so I was really like confused and overwhelmed for a while. But then I watched a, someone play through it, and I was like, oh, like you have to be really like inquisitive and like observe observational Mm -hmm. and that's not something I'm used to in games or at least I guess because I haven't played these type of games I don't think about like oh I could blow up this rock over here let me pick this up I don't think about those things like as someone who hasn't played these types of games at least um Mm -hmm. so when I watched the person play I was like oh like I have to think about the whole world in a very different way um than I have been and I think I also there's also some this isn't related to like why I picked up Breath of the Wild but there's also something in me I don't know if it's like the immigrant or the first daughter only child Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is but there's also something in me that I'm like I can't fail. Mm. Like failing is bad. Uh, um, And like with poetry, I think with playing games, like in my head, I was like the best gamers never die. Mm. And so my goal was always to never die. And then I watch people play. I watch people. I started watching people play among us. And I was like, wait, these people die all the time. And like you play Zelda and you're dying all the time. And it's like, Oh, the point is not to not die. And Mm -hmm. once I realized that, I was like, oh, this is a very different game than when I thought it was. Um, And it it totally opened me up to the experience. Yeah, I mean, I think that that take that you're having is, is super valid. Like, I think this game stands apart in the Zelda series specifically for sort of diverging from what was like a very cinematic and I would say like textbook RPG action adventure in that it would tell you like, this is what you need to do next and this is what you need mm-hmm. to continue. Um, but Breath of the Wild really sort of, uh, like as you said, like it rewards experimentation. Um, I still read... Uh, tweets or message boards from people who are like, oh my God, I figured out that I could just completely avoid this enemy by yeah, yeah. <laughs> gliding from this rock. Like, there's so many ways that you can approach a problem. There's mm-hmm. multiple answers to every puzzle, mm-hmm. every dungeon. Um, and it just like rewards that curiosity. Like, like there, there may be no better way to learn than to die. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like I I don't know if you if you like that feeling. I recommend Hades, which is also on Switch. Someone just mentioned that to me. Yeah. Um 
another game that definitely rewards like that that takes that familiar like I really identified with what you said about um like dying in a game being connected to failure um like I think Hades uh earlier this summer really unlocked for me like oh dying can be a fun part of playing a game instead mm. of the part where I decide that I'm a piece of shit and need to quit playing for the day <laughs> 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 oh my god um and you also men- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> whereas i never made it past that i never made the realization that dying in hades yeah. didn't make me a piece of shit still working on it yeah <laughs> it's a process healing isn't linear yeah, you yeah. Know? um i hope more games get made like this sort of playing with uh the sort of expectations we've come to develop collectively about how a game should operate or what the mechanics of a game should be. Like, I feel like um, it's 2021. It's time to break out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, Angbin, you told us about how um, playing Breath of the Wild and Among Us taught you a lot about writing poetry and like being a creative person in general. Um, so I'd love to hear you speak more to that. Like, how have you seen that manifest? Yeah, I would love to. I think, well, like, it's a lot of what I've mentioned already. Like, the thing with poetry is, like, when you're when you're with your teachers and you're learning, a lot of them say, like, p- play, play with the words, practice. And, of mm-hmm. course, like, you, I feel that and I want to do that, but it's really scary. Um, and it's also really scary because it's really personal. It feels like, oh, this is, like, my life experience that I'm putting down on words for someone to read one day and I'm going to have to submit it to a journal. Um, So it's like all of those things. And I think you don't actually get to practice practicing in a way. Mm. And I think like playing Breath of the Wild, it's like you, you get to practice that practicing. Like what does Mm. that kind of failing and or failing as in dying, what does that look like? And that, it really has no consequences. Um, And not to say like the real life, real life doesn't have consequences, but like when a poem is in your Google docs or in your notes or whatever you're working on, there's no consequences. Like you haven't Mm. sent it to anybody. Um, You can, you can fail at it. No one's, no one has to see it. It's for you. And I think like getting comfortable with that, like being bad at stuff. Like I know, like I said, I went over to my friends yesterday and we played um, the new Spider-Man for PS5. Mm, and I Miles was, Morales? Yeah, Miles Morales. And it was so fun, but I was extremely terrible at it. Mm. But, <laughs> and I think in the past, I would have just given up and like, I can't mm. do this. I don't want to play this anymore. But I was just like, just let me keep going. Let me keep being bad. It doesn't matter. Like it's good. I'll figure it out eventually. Like it's going to take some, um, it's going to take playing to fi- to get better. You don't just yeah. imagine that one day. And in a way it feels like very simple, but like it also feels very opening to like be able to practice that failure in a way that feels safe. Mm-hmm. And then like, now I feel like when I write poems, I'm not thinking about like, Oh, I'm going to publish this poem and I want to, do this with this poem it's just me writing the things and me writing the things I'm scared of that I might not ever share with anybody and that Mm -hmm. feels okay it's like yeah I just have to write this stuff down um and then also like I mentioned with like watching people stream it has Mm -hmm. opened my eyes so much because I think in the past you didn't unless you went to a friend's house that was the only time you were really seeing other people play games and they weren't offering live commentary you know yeah um, <laughs> but like here but but now but then I started watching people play Among Us because I was like yo I need to be the best Among Us player <laughs> like, <laughs> research uh, research and then but then I started watching and I was like oh wait these people do moves that are crazy I would never do this because it's so ridiculous and of course some of them are trying to make YouTube videos and all of that but sometimes you're just trying out stuff and seeing if it will work and that kind of experimentation just felt so exciting for me and also like opened me up in poetry because it's like yeah just do shit because it feels good and it's like maybe it'll fail maybe you will be caught as the imposter but at least like you tried something different and maybe you won't fail um and it's and I think that that and like the whole experimentation bit and like try 
I think I always get stuck on trying the same thing again and mm. again. And like, and you know, it's, it's like you're building a bridge and you get like two inches away and then you have, you don't have enough material and you're like starting over and you build that same bridge again and again. Cause you're like, I'm only two inches away. Eventually it will work, but it just doesn't work. And you're just like, Oh, and before that's what I used to do. I'm just like, build the bridge again and again, do the same move again and again, again, and again. And now I'm like, Oh no, like maybe I just have to do something different. Like maybe that's not working. And I think that's been really opening to be like, you know, uh, if it's not work, if it's getting me close, but it's not getting me there, is it getting me there? Um, is it actually getting me to the, artistic creation that I want. Um, just because I'm getting close to it doesn't mean I'm there. What you're saying about experimentation, I feel like really resonates. I It strikes me how, how little I give myself or we give ourselves permission to experiment, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Like especially in the workplace. Uh, it, it really struck me what you were saying. I think about how, um, like I'm a, a digital product, like UX designer. So I do a lot of quote unquote, creative work, but <laughs> it's work that is sort of very process size and has systems of thought applied over it and a philosophy that's been developed over years and branding mm-hmm. and rules and patterns that we've established. And so um, oftentimes, like, I'll get in these creative ruts initially because I'll be asked to solve a problem and I feel like, oh, I already know the pieces that I have to use. Like, I don't know how I'm going to put that together. Like, it's not going to work. And it's not until I sit down and just start playing with the same building blocks that have always been there and and just trying stuff. Like, I get to a point where I'm like, I'm not a genius and I don't immediately have the answer because I'm still, I suck. (laughs) Imagine that (laughs) immigrant first, it's like first gen mentality of like, there's only do (laughs) and succeed. There's no try. Like, just... Just my Asian American uh, bastardization of Yoda's old saying, but like, um, <laughs> like it's not until I just start trying shit that I that it's unlocked. Like something mm-hmm. that I never would have thought out thought of before just spits itself out yes. in, a- after five yeah. minutes of me yeah. just letting go of having mm-hmm. to be right or letting mm. go of it having to come out perfect. Yeah, um, no, I and love that. I- I I totally relate with that. And I also think about how, like, sometimes in the game, like, you just got to leave. You just got (laughs) to leave where you are. Because I'm like, I'm not ready to beat this Lionel right now. Like, I do not have the tools. I do not have the stamina. I can't do this. And sometimes I feel the same way about, like, a work problem or a poetry issue I'm having. I'm like, maybe right now I just don't have the tools for this. Like, I, I need to go think on this. But let me go do something else that I feel like I can do. And I'll come back here maybe one day. I don't know if I'm coming back to the Lionel, but um, maybe. (laughs) But it's here for me when I feel ready. And I I feel like that's been that's been such an interesting part because in a lot of games, there's you can't escape like those people. Like you can't escape like I guess they're not the main bosses, but like the mini bosses. You Mm. can't always escape them, and it feels really good to be like, nope, not doing this. Don't have the right tools. Don't have the right armor. (laughs) Boundaries. I don't have the time today. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So yeah, I think that has also it. Similarly, like when I'm having an issue, it's like, okay, I don't have to solve this today. Can I? Can I just put this down for a second and like go do something else for a minute? Um, And I feel like that's been helpful. Helpful too. Mm-hmm. There was this piece um, on The Verge about Breath of the Wild. Uh, it was a review that came out uh, a couple years ago when it was coming out by Andrew Webster. And near the end of the piece, um, Andrew writes, more so than just about any game series, Zelda's heart lies in exploration. That moment of seeing a towering mountain in the distance and realizing that eventually you'll be mm. able to reach the top. Breath of the Wild takes this idea cuts out the fluff and expands upon it. It pulls ideas from other games like crafting or survival, yet makes them feel perfectly at home in its beloved universe. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like this aspect of taking pieces that really work from other games, cutting out the fluff, really Mm -hmm. honing in on on what matters and delivering that experience is like poetry. Yeah. Um, Like what is writing great writing other than Ooh. copying what works from other writers and yeah. forming it and, and reiterating it into something that yeah. resonates again. Um, 
I love that passage. And that's like, amazing. <laughs> that's beautiful. We we stand Zelda in this house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as we should. I'm like, when is the next one coming out? I heard there's the Breath of the Wild too. So, Angbin, it's been lovely hanging out with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, where can folks follow your work? Do you have any public social media you'd like to share? Yeah, I have um, a Twitter account that's, uh, I, I'm annoyed at myself for doing this, but I spelled my name weird. <laughs> um, it, my, it's my name, but there, instead of the second E, there's a three. Um, and then my Instagram I mentioned before is angry bean with an I and two E's, not E-A. Um, so yeah, you can find me there. And I also have a website that I just uh, put together. Um, it's angbeansalim.com. So you can find my poems and other things there. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us on Pixel Therapy. Thank you so much for having me. This was so beautiful. Thank you. Time is up for today's session of Pixel Therapy. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope that listening to our thoughts and feelings gave you some thoughts and feelings of your own. If you want more Pixel Therapy, come check us out at patreon.com slash pixeltherapypod, where you can snag that monthly bonus episode for just $2 a month, plus opportunities to get involved with the community and influence the show directly. If you're not up for contributing monetarily, but you enjoyed this episode, there are lots of ways you can support us for free, in particular by reviewing us on Apple Podcasts and Podchaser.com as part of their Review for Good Month and following us on Instagram and other social media at Pixel Therapy Pod. That stuff is just as important and we appreciate it just as much. Remember that Pixel Therapy is a happy member of the But Why Though Podcast Network so you can support us by supporting them and heading over to ButWhyThoughPodcast.com. That's though with a T-H-O. Take a peek at the inclusive geek community they're building around pop culture news, reviews, and kick-ass podcasts like yours truly. And you can keep up with all this stuff and more by visiting our website at pixeltherapypod.com. Finally, since we like to put our money and our energy where our mouth is, we end every episode with a recommended side quest. Thank you so much to Ang Bean for the recommendation this week. This week's side quest is the Let Us Breathe Fund. In their words... The Let Us Breathe Fund is the only NYC-based fund led by and for Black activists organizing around police reform and building Black liberation. We started the fund in 2015 following the death of Eric Garner at the hands of the NYPD. The fund provided rapid response in that crisis moment and now supports the long-term leadership of Black New Yorkers who are fighting police violence and structural racism. In the wake of George Floyd's killing in Minnesota and its devastating similarity to Eric Garner's death, communities across NYC and the nation began marching under I Can't Breathe banners in unprecedented protests against anti-Black racism and police violence. In 2020, we witnessed the communities of Black, Indigenous, people of color as they faced the compounding crises of the COVID-19 pandemic while also envisioning and leading calls for systemic change across all sectors. This led to renewed attention within philanthropy to answer calls to increase support for BIPOC leadership and addressing institutional racism. Historic moments like these require an ecosystem of groups to make demands and to implement transformative change. We cannot predict how long the how We cannot predict how the long overdue reckoning that began in 2020 will unfold. What we hope is that the challenge we seek to address, building and sustaining a deeply underfunded Black-led organizing infrastructure in the city of New York, will have new champions, including you. Um, You can join the New Yorkers who have contributed to the Let Us Breathe Fund by visiting northstarfund.org. North Star is the steward of of the Let Us Breathe Fund, a social justice organization envisioning a world in which resources and power are equitably shared and a future where everyone can live with dignity and thrive. Again, that's northstarfund.org. Thank you for that side quest, Spencer. That is our show for today. So go forth, run a story mission, level up some stats, and don't forget to hug an NPC every now and then. We'll be back soon with some more Pixel Pixel Therapy. therapy. Bye-bye. Nice.